Okay, well, um, thank you for that introduction, um, Shannon. And uh, really today, what I'm really going to describe is, uh, we heard earlier this morning from Tom about the brave new world of uh, archaeology, where community archaeology is increasingly sitting alongside uh, commercial archaeology and university research uh, as a vehicle for research. Um, and we also heard from uh, Cara with an example of that um, for more locally. Uh, Perth and Canross Heritage Trust, we've been doing these community archaeology projects for over a decade now. And really what I'm going to try to describe today is really uh, to explain how there are a, a kind of an underlying theme of research to a number of the projects that we're actually doing. Um, so I'll really be outlining some recent projects, some on ongoing projects, and some planned projects in the near future uh, that really uh, bring together, if you like, and maximize the benefit of community archaeology. Um, everyone should have their Archaeology Month brochure there. Um, uh, really, all of the projects I'm, des that I'm describing have been community archaeology projects. So we've involved schools, you know, e uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary education, local communities, and the wider uh, archaeological community in all of these projects. So if you're interested, you, or if you think uh, you know someone who might be interested, get them a copy of our leaflet and get them to get in touch with us. Um, so the theme that we're really discussing here, I'm describing monumental Iron Age architecture, but hopefully as I go through these projects, you'll realize that the kind of theme is primarily that, but also sort of, uh, it kind of merges in with kind of early medieval of the area as well, uh, and, in spe and specifically with the, uh, the turf longhouses in Glenshee, which is a focus of one of our projects. Uh, but some of the themes there, materials, monu monumentality, and also uh, uh, the nature of agriculture and trade within the landscape of the high, uh, highland zone and the lowland zone in, in the Tay Basin is really really the, the, the thrust of what we're getting to. So if you like, in a nutshell, the, the wider kind of picture is, if you like, 1000 BC to 1000 AD uh, and what's going on in, in, in this area. It's one of the benefits of my kind of county archaeologist role is that you have quite a fixed um, uh, view of one area over a very long period of time and it allows you to watch all sorts of bits of work and bring them together. This isn't for reading, but it's really just to say that all of these projects are underpinned by SCARF and the, the very excellent research framework that's now in place. Uh, and I'll come, maybe come back to this later on if I have a chance in terms of uh, the need for perhaps defining SCARF more regionally in terms of, uh, if not regional research frameworks, then perhaps if you like, appendices to SCARF, um, but we can discuss those later on. But those kind of highlight some of the, uh, some of the projects uh, or, or some of the uh, research themes that we're tackling through these three projects. First one, the Black Spout. Um, it's a, a, a monument type that was kind of misunderstood and uh, misrepresented in the literature, um, although there had been a number of excavations dating back to the First World War right through to the 70s. There'd been a misunderstanding of the site, um, of the site type, and so we looked at this site outside of uh, Pitlochry, um, and this is really where it is. You can see the terrain model. Um, it's sitting on the edge of uh, of, of the Edradour burn there, uh, and our excavations uncovered um, really large monumental type buildings. Uh, this time, this time with a, a scarcement ledge on the inside of of this wall, you can see and really just chunky big walls. You can see a three meter thick wall here. This is a lintel stone that would have went above the entrance to the building. Uh, really just substantial uh, architecture altogether and really uh, somewhere in between hill forts and roundhouses are these monumental roundhouses, if you like, or ring forts or other ways they've been described. In this example, we found that um, there had been significant rebuilding. So you've got Iron Age architecture one side and a really poorly rebuilt um, other side that's been largely uh, remodeled uh, and that was dated to the early medieval period. And so again you can see um, what we consider to be the original configuration which would have been uh, probably symmetrical um, which has then been remodeled at a later date. Uh, we had fairly good um, preservation of some internal features but again um, in addition to paving here, this intramural cell, another feature, if you like, of complex um, uh, 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 monumental structures like broths and dunes. Um, some other interesting features, this, this central pit, or our central rock cut feature inside the roundhouse, 
and a quern built into uh, the entrance of the of the uh, of the intramural cell. The usual kind of array of Iron Age artifacts and um, and Iron Age dates for the site, albeit with uh, an early medieval and a 12th century date from some later contexts. Um, so you know, uh, this allowed us to recreate. Um, uh, and think about how these sites were constructed and how they were used over time, um, and in particular what their role was in terms of the economy. Uh, and I think one of the other themes I'd like to sort of, uh, is really our, 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 our approach with these projects uh, is very much to look at the landscape context and in as wide a context in terms of the architecture of the monuments as well. So in this particular site, we looked at lots of various options for possible roofings, uh, you know, that we went into in great detail looking at all of these um, different uh, approaches, uh, including things like visibility, analysis of how they sit in the landscape and how they may have been viewed uh, in the landscape, but also looking at things like place names. So we had a study of all of the place names which, uh, which uncovered this uh, particular association with the Fian tradition in the area and uh, Finn the Cool, if you like, and the the, the, the case will do the black castles as they're very commonly known in the area and obviously also the environmental um, picture for the wider landscape. Uh, so at the end of this project what we really got was a kind of if you like a localized regional uh, or a, a quite a localized understanding of all the little red dots are these big monumental roundhouses, here are all the tranogs on the lochs as you can see and it allowed us to have a little bit of a think about how the occasional hill forts in these areas would have interacted with these monumental roundhouses and the Cranogs. Uh, and this is a, a, a representation by David Simon showing uh, the, the, the excavation of Berenach, um, one of the first sites uh, excavated um, by Watson, the place name expert, and some of the other sites and site types that would have existed in the area. So the second project uh, is really uh, focuses on hill forts and the Estuary, and it's part of a a large new project we've got ongoing in the Trust and the Tay Landscape Partnership Scheme, which is great because it allows us to do all sorts of other things, not just archaeology and historic buildings, but path access and all sorts of things. But one of those projects is looking at a number of hill forts around the Tay Estuary. Uh, and it's really, if you like, building on work that SERF has already been doing west of our study area. And you can see here um, the, the excavations at Ben Efri, uh, just above Ochterader. And their excavations at Castle Law, um, south of Forgandeni. Um, and these are fairly recent excavations. And of course, one of the sites that turned up there was the Broch at Castle Craig, uh, just below Ben Efri and uh, Craig Rossi, for those of you who know that, uh, that group of hills. Uh, and this is this wonderful Broch site that turned up there. Uh, and one of the sites we're interested in is uh, this site, Abernethy Law which of course was the focus of a, a very early community archaeology project in the late 19th century, where a couple of local individuals excavated part of the fort, which was eventually written up by Christensen. Um, and, it, and it revealed this fantastic facade, uh, which, which gave rise to the, 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 straight, you know, the Abernethy type uh, of timber-laced fort, etc. But as yet, no dating, because obviously it was pre-radiocarbon dating. So we've got ideas of the, the excavation plans there, etc. So we've been carrying out various surveys um, in order just to identify what's really on the site and, and allow us to think about how we may approach those. This very early picture um, taken from Newbera just shows the importance of the next group of sites here at Moncrief. And at Moncrief there are suggested to be two hill forts, Mordon Top itself and uh, Moncrief Hill. The first, Moncrief Hill, it appears that there may not be a site uh, here at all. It appears in the first edition map. We're still trying to chase where this came from because uh, we've had the Royal Commission and John Sheriff's team up there recently, and they're saying, look, if we'd come across this, we probably wouldn't have said there's a hill fort here. So one of the things we've been doing is we've been doing some geophysics, and later on this year, we're going to be doing some trenches just to see if there is a hill fort there or not. Um, the second site, we've got no problem with there being a hill fort there. This is um, uh, moored on top, or Karnak, on top of Moncrief Hill, crowns the crescent of the hill. And uh, there's absolutely no doubt here that there's a significant series of forts and structures on there. And again, we've been carrying out some geophysics so far. And um, hot off the press, this survey from this month, uh, again, John Sheriff's team have been uncovering um, 
what appear to be several phases, if not several different fort sites, and, in, and also this large circular, or, or, or this large mound quite central to uh, the site, which doesn't seem to really fit into anything at the moment. So lots of targets for excavations here next year, which will start three sessions a year over the next four years. Um, so lots of scope there. But some of the other things that have really come up from this uh, survey by the Commission is the, the industrial scale of quarrying on this site that hadn't been recognised, and also the fact that there appears to be archaeological excavation on the site for which there is no record in the literature. So we are currently chasing up all sorts of archives uh, to see if there's any record of this archaeological excavation. So zooming out, if you like, in terms of our what's going on in the, in the area. We can now see kind of larger forts down in the lowland zone, our little monumental um, roundhouses and the Cranogs, um, more open settlement um, and roundhouse settlement. And these, these yellow ones here are these longhouses, these turf longhouses. And this is the, uh, this is the, um, the, 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 the focus of this next project, which I'll just briefly outline to you. And again, um, these aerial photographs really just show the wealth of, uh, of, of archaeology that survived in these upland environments here, largely because, the, uh, or, or, or because of the limited nature of um, agricultural improvements in parts of Strathardle and Glenshee have resulted in the survival of lots of uh, circular buildings, roundhouses, uh, but also these elongated structures. Um, uh, which, when uh, surveyed by the Royal Commission in advance of their northeast Perth volume, mapped out as, uh, as looking at, like this, and at that time they were suggested as being early medieval, commonly with rounded ends, often with little porches attached and um, uh, annexes built onto the sides, etc. And of course, uh, in the last PSAS, um, Martin Carver had brought together the results of the excavations at Pitcarmic, which gave the, the site, time, site type its name. Uh, and we can see on the left-hand side here uh, the excavations at Pitcarmic in this rounded structure and kind of comparable things from Glenshee. Quite small buildings, sometimes much bigger buildings. You can see much larger structures here. Uh, and at Glenshee, we're looking at a site which is all focused around this wonderful um, ring cairn. Uh, and that's really the, uh, another reoccurring theme with this group is, is inherited landscapes, these Pictish sites tending to be where there were earlier monuments. So again, in the Upland Zone, this time we're taking the commission survey, we've been doing quite localised geophysics, and then larger landscape kind of scale geophysics of it, which have been turning up all sorts of interesting features, uh, clearance cairns and lots of things that you haven't seen. Uh, so this is the, the focus of our excavation trenches uh, for this year, which will be excavating throughout June. Details are in your leaflet. If you'd like to come and see the digger get involved, please do so. Um, and really, just to briefly go through some of these, this is the sorts of things we're finding. So you can see here the big ring here and here. And the first building we're looking at here was this big elongated guy here. And it's fairly ephemeral. I mean, these are tough structures in the, uh, built in the soil. Uh, you know, you're recovering these in, in the soil that they came from. So really quite ephemeral and quite difficult to excavate. But we're picking up also, this is a corner of one building, through geophysics. And one of the things here that has been the success of geophysics in an upland environment here, and picking up here things like this, this linear feature, this charcoal-filled linear feature underneath the, the, the longhouse which um, was found to date pretty much uh, just before the, 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 the construction itself. Lots of metal artifacts, which from the Pictish period could be quite unusual in that, you know, in that they're fairly everyday metal work rather than sort of um, the, the higher end of things. So um, we're, we're, we're beginning to look into some of this, this material. Uh, glass beads. And this other building we excavated here, this smaller one, which is going to be the focus of this year's dig, and we can see here um, with these uh, low-level aerials, um, a lot of stonework at one end of this building. But really, if you look at that area, we're really trying to pick out something that's really just a little bit defined by very occasional stones. And we can see here a whole series of pits that came underneath this. Uh, and we think that suddenly these pits start to uh, look a little bit like they might actually connect with some of these. Now, these pits were excavated last year. I, I, I was suspicious. I, I, I thought that they may well date from 
the time of the lot of the uh, the ring kiln itself. The Vulcan back being um, very much early medieval, and you can see some of them there. You can also see some of the survival of the turfs, um, uh, and that's some of the, the better preserved bits. Uh, we've been looking at soils on the site, and also again, um, Richard Tipping's looking at um, the, the pollen cores for us, the, the, uh, the peat cores to, to look at the pollen down the line. Here's our radiocarbon dates to date, and you can see it's really big broadband, which are all very, very nicely uh, around the same time. So our interpretation of this group of sites is moving away from there being kind of um, reuse of the site over a period of time to the fact that we might be looking at one kind of dispersed farm unit, if you like, perhaps with different functions for these buildings. But it's overlying an earlier uh, landscape, and these clearance cairns uh, are almost certainly prehistoric. We're also picking up um, trackways and boundaries and things that are identified through the, uh, the geophysics. This feature here, this kind of appeared as a kind of unusual ring, and lo and behold, there was a ring of stones inside. It may be connected to metal working, so again, we're looking into this. And in terms of the site type themselves, we're looking at you know, parallels for how these longhouses may have looked. Everything from sort of vernacular, um, later Scottish vernacular architecture and crook frame buildings, etc. Uh, and these are the fabulous examples at the Highland Folk Museum. Um, but we're also in discussion with partners uh, in Holland, and this is a reconstruction of an early medieval longhouse uh, on the Frisian coast. Um, and we're also looking at um, other parallels, such as in Iceland, where this turf tradition of building survives right into the 19th century. But of course, you've got here sites which, oops, sorry, um, which are very much like what we have in uh, Viking Age buildings in Glenshee, which could could easily be uh, in Iceland, which could easily be uh, very similar to the ones we're finding in Glenshee. So these are some of our uh, first drafts, if you like, of our of our reconstruction drawings for how they may have looked. So we're looking at how the buildings may have been configured them, uh, themselves, um, but we're also looking at how they may have been used in the landscape and how they may have appeared in the landscape. These are very much just initial drawings. So um, really just to conclude, uh, a number of different projects, all community-based, all funded by different partners, different, um, different types of organizations involved in all of these, but really, I just hope to have demonstrated that um, what, what, we're, what we're really doing is um, bringing additional benefit to the idea of kind of individual community archaeology projects by linking them together uh, in the hope of bringing, uh, if you like, answering some bigger questions in terms of what's really going on in this uh, important geog uh, geographical node uh, in the east coast of Scotland. So very broadly, we may, we may say that the Highland Lowland line you can see running here is clearly uh, differentiates the kind of hill forts and forts dominated area from the highland zone west of the Tay. This is broadly the Tay, and you can find all of the roundhouses tend to be west of the Tay. There are no big Iron Age structures in northeast Perthshire uh, at all, and this, of course, has been surveyed by the Royal Commission for the northeast survey, uh, northeast Perthshire survey. So, if there were monumental roundhouses or hill forts in that area, we would know about them. There don't appear to be any. The only interesting thing from the, or, 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 or potential little um, highlight there is on Loch Beany, uh, up by Spittal of Glenshee, where Pont records uh, a cranog, um, which is then marked uh, at something annotated something like "Ye sometimes dwelling of the of the lords of Glenshee and Strathardo," and that might be a hint to a very much earlier occupation on a cranog site there. But there's nothing that east in this area which really is similar to the to the Tay to the West. There may well be that there are more uh, unenclosed um, roundhouses and indeed Pitcarnic buildings that may be waiting to be found west of the Tay, but we certainly know that that, that, that dichotomy works one way, if you like. Um, and then you can bring into things that things like the Souterrains down in the Castle Gowrie and Strathmore, start discussing the crop mark record and potentials and bias and record, etc. But you can start to envisage um, you know, what's going on there between where predominantly cattle-based economies are and where uh, greater uh, containers of grain wealth are. So we're looking at agriculture over time, and that idea of drove routes may indeed go back not only to the Middle Ages, but they might go back well into prehistory. 
And we're also looking at the evolution of, um, of building types, uh, you know, over, as I say, two, two millennia. I think that really concludes me, so thank you very much.